Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Praise his holy name. Let us pray. Holy Father, I do thank you and praise you. I stand here as one who's under the drip point. I give thanks to you, Holy Father, for our man of God. Hallelujah. He teaches us with knowledge and with understanding. Thank you, Father, that we can follow him, for he follows Christ. Thank you so much. I give you honor for this privilege to stand before your people. I don't take it lightly. I trust the Holy Spirit. I trust that he will lead me and guide me in the way that I should go. I trust and ask that he grants me wisdom and grant me your holy boldness and utterance whereby he will be able to think through my mind, speak through my lips that word that you have given to me for this, your people. I believe, Father, that your word will bless the people, effect the change, and bring glory unto yourself. Now, Holy Father, I pray that the revelation of this word will shed light, flood our spirit with light, Therefore, be transferred to our soulish realm, renewing our minds and helping us to understand my message today concerning the mind of Christ. Can you say amen? It is the word of God. It is God speaking to me. His purpose is to bless me, to change me, and to be glorified through my life. Therefore, I set myself in agreement with his word by having a receptive heart and a readiness of mind to receive. And by being a doer of the word I hear and not a hearer only, I realize that obedience to God's word is essential in order to have God's best for my life. Amen. Now, I was talking to the Lord about what he wanted me to do and how he wanted me to go, how he wanted me to go. And one of the things that he reminded me of and that was when I first came here, I'm not going to go through the whole thing of how I came, but it was by divine connection. I heard him speak at a church I was invited to, and um, there was another speaker there from California, Pastor, and um, we was at Word of Life, and I was there visiting, and I always say I sat straight up in that chair, and I said in myself, that's the level of word I've been looking for, because I was looking for a church home because I suffered under two church splits, one in New Jersey and then one here in Florence. And so um, I was looking for a church home, and uh, Pastor Holmes got up and said, I'm going to do something that I don't normally do, open the doors to someone else's church. Hallelujah. God is awesome the way he works. I went up because of him. That's why I went and joined that church. I'm living in Florence, working in Florence. I came to visit. I joined because of him. I said, that's the level of word I need. And so, um, word of life now, uh, the Wittenbergs, whom I love very much and dearly, they're now in Mississippi, Mississippi. And uh, I was walking through my neighborhood one day, and I say, Lord, I said, I'm talking to you about a pastor, and you ain't said nothing to me yet. And I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go up to Word and Worship, sit there for a while under Pastor Holmes. Then I'm going to go to another a preacher I know and sit under his ministry. And uh, wherever I feel the warmest, that's where I'm going to stay. And then I said to myself, boy, you don't talk to God like that. And I said, Lord, forgive me. But I came on United Prayer Night. And so... When I came for United Prayer, if you remember our old church, because we're getting a new one now. I was way off 
on the, on the far right side in the back in between two rows, almost up there by where the sound booth was, up there by two rows. And a pastor was down here on the seat and um, he was telling us how to pray. And then he got up and he said, um, here's what I want you to do. I'm going in the back and pray for the congregation. And here's what I want you all to be doing while I'm back there. Here's how I want you to pray. And he got up and he went to the back. And uh, when he left, there was nobody back there that could hear me. So I was verbally talking to the Lord. And I said to him, I said, now, Lord, I'm going to join this church, and I said it like this, because I like it, because I was a little frustrated. I said, because I like it. And I said, uh, thought to myself again, I said, boy, you don't talk to the Lord like that. So I said, Lord, forgive me. I said, um, but what I'm saying is that if you don't want me to join this church, see, I hadn't been to the other one yet. If you don't want me to join this church, you need to tell me something. And uh, so, meanwhile, the man of God comes back out. He says, I have a word for the congregation and a word for that man over there. And pointed the finger at me. And he, turned, he said, let me take care of him, then I'll take care of you. And he turned in his seat and he said, when I was in the back praying, the Lord brought your face up to me, and he said, you tell this man, I drew him here. And after he sat and learned for a while, then he'll understand why. And he asked me, he said, uh, do you receive that from me? And I said, uh, 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 yes, sir. Because I was startled in the fact that I'm back there talking to God. God's talking to him. Hallelujah. And uh, I was startled at what happened and what was said. And so he didn't know for a couple of months, I believe we had a, a, a breakfast, a men's breakfast. And um, I raised my hand and I asked the pastor if I could say a word. By then I had joined the church. And um, he said, yes, go ahead. And I shared with him, and that was the first time he heard and got the flip side of that coin of what actually happened. I'm talking to the Lord, and the Lord's talking to him, bringing his face up to me back there. My, 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 my. I mean to tell y'all something. If y'all don't know your pastor, I know my pastor. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I, I heard his voice when I was at Word of Life. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And I sat straight up. I know that now from his teachings. And um, I'm so grateful to be here, grateful to be a part of, and so grateful for what God has is, is done, what God is doing, and what God is going to do with us. Can you say amen? amen. My text is going to be taken from, and it's the mind of Christ. It's going to be taken from uh, Philip, Philippians, the second chapter, verses 5 through 11. I'm going to read this from the King James, and then I'm going to take a reading from the NLT, the New Living Translation. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Hallelujah, glory be to God. I'm in Ephesians. Don't y'all worry about me, I'll get there. And it reads, beginning at the fifth verse, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him 
and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. New Living Translation states, and I'll begin at verse 5, you must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had, though he was God. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. What does it mean when I was preparing this study, the question came to me, what does it mean to have the mind of Christ? What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? It means to be like-minded. It means to see things from Christ's perspective as he saw them. It means to respond to things or life situations just as Jesus did. How many know that, we, that Jesus is our prime example in all that we think, speak, and do. He has given your life, he has given my life purpose, and he has given us, ladies and gentlemen, a course to run on. Praise God, hallelujah. We know some things that many people haven't been taught in church because there was much, and even though I had been in word churches, there was much that I had to learn when I came here. As a matter of fact, when he said, after I have sat and learned for a while, then I'll understand why. I was home studying and uh, there was a prompting in my spirit. It was like a thought. It was like a thought in my spirit. And um, it had nothing to do with what I was studying. I was studying one of, one of uh, pastor's uh, uh, CDs, and um, I, I paused and, and sat there, and I knew that the Lord was talking to me about something. And he said to me, what does it mean to sit? I jumped right on that, because y'all know how intelligent I am. I jumped right on that. I said, it means to be studious. And just like that silence, that's how it was. <laughs> so I sat back up in the chair and I thought to myself, well, that went over, didn't go over too good. So I went back to study. About two years later, I was in my study area again and the same prompting came up, the same words. What does it mean to sit? Now, this is not off of what I'm teaching. This is right on it. What does it mean to sit? And I had learned, I had an audience with him where we stayed together most of the day. And um, he had told me, whenever God asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer but it's because he's getting ready to teach you something. And uh, this time I was a little more cautious and more thoughtful. And I said to the Lord, I said, I think it means to submit, to submit. Jesus was submitted to his father. He was submitted to his father wholeheartedly. And he's our prime example. People who are not taught correctly, people may be in church, but the church hadn't gotten into them yet because they haven't been taught. 
submit. Sub meaning to go under, like a submarine under the water. You have to place yourself under somebody else's authority. When I thought about the word that he brought to us last night, which was tremendous. Most churches don't get word like that. The word he brought to us last night, how, how to be cautious and, and how to be protective because he and he alone is the angel of the church. Hallelujah, glory be to God. We have other ministry gifts, but he, he alone is the angel of the church. Glory be to God. And then the Lord was letting me know. He said, well, you know you had to learn. You had much to learn. He said, but I told you to sit. He said, I want you to be submissive. People have come and people have gone. I said to the Lord one time, I said, it's a good thing no one said to me anything about getting up leaving. Not only had I been through two church splits, I said, but um, because I would have said, I'm, com I'm, I'm committed to this man. I'm submitted under this man. God drew me here. God drew me here. I will say this. I did see one person that left. And we embraced, shook hands, how you doing type of thing. And uh, he said to me, where you at now? I said, I said I'm at... Um, Word and Worship Center. And he stopped, hesitated, and stared at me. And he looked at me like he wanted to say, why are you still there? I was hoping that he would. <laughs> I was ready. Because God drew me here. You see? But he didn't go there. But he didn't go there. But I thank God for the teachings that we get here I thank God for the love that exudes from our leaders to all of us. And I'll say to anybody seated out there, if you're going to get up and leave here, you don't know what, what God, that God had planted you here and you done uprooted yourself and gone somewhere else and that is not going to work. Because what you need is right here where you're at. Right here, right now. Anybody out there know what I'm talking about? So I had to submit. Another thing I began to find out when I was studying this lesson was that people want to make commitments. But are you submitted? Are you submitted? I go back to this scripture, and it states, about Jesus, and it says, starts out, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He made himself of no reputation when he came here. He stripped himself, in other words, of his Godhead powers. He had to be anointed, remember? Had to be anointed by the Holy Ghost. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. He submitted himself wholeheartedly to God. And he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He was incarnate. Isaiah said there was nothing about him. If you looked at him, there was nothing about him that would make you, that would draw you to him. He was an ordinary looking man. But yet when he opened his mouth, and those miracles that he did. And that man, that Pharisee, that ruler, that stated, we know that you are a man from, sent from God. For no man can do the miracles that you do except God be with him. And Jesus let him know, you can't know anything about, about uh, the kingdom of God. He said, unless you're born again. You got to be born, you got to be born again to know the kingdom of God. And he was a ruler among the Jews. I remember going, attending a church up north 
our pastor took us over there, and this man had this red banner across his pulpit, and it said, no man can do these miracles except God be with him. I said, I said to the pastor, I said, you know, I said, he ought to read the rest of that, what Jesus said. I said, because I, I said, what does that mean with that banner up there and what he has on that banner? I said, uh, he, I think he missed it, and he did, and he did. But I want to show you some things that I selected because you can paint this topic with a wide brush about Jesus. I asked the question, what does it mean to have the mind of Christ? It's to be like-minded. I submit to you, first of all, that Jesus had a selfish, a selfless mind, a selfless mind. Hallelujah. In John 4 and 34, look at that with me, please. I want to point out something to you in John 4 and 34. I think I'll read from verse 31. Well, what give you some background on this, what was actually happening. This is where Jesus was talking to that woman at the well. And his disciples had gone to the city to get some food. And they came back. And in the 31st verse, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat that you know not of. Wherefore, said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him aught? And Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. I, I submit to you that Jesus' aim and objective was not to cater to the body, but rather to do the will of God. The mind of Christ is to do the will of God, and Jesus being our prime example that's what we're to do. We're to do the mind of God. John 5 and verse 19. I'll give you some background on this. The Jews wanted to persecute Jesus because he healed on the Sabbath day. They wanted to persecute him even all the more because he made himself equal with God. Verse 18 states, therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Verse 19, and then Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doth the son likewise, showing his oneness with God. The scripture says, he that is joined to, to the Lord is one spirit. Can you say amen? In verse 30, Jesus makes a statement, a profound statement. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Turn with me. I think I want to go there. I didn't have that plan. But turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. I want to show you something. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. And uh, let's see where we'll, be, where we'll read. I'll start from... Verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have 
the mind of Christ. Glory to God. Glory to God. Verse 14 speaks of the natural man receiving not the things of the Spirit of God. Now, by the way of the law of double reference, I would say a natural man is a person that's not saved. Because when we get saved, we get, we, get, we get saved in our spirit. We get saved in our spirit. And as we study and meditate the word, then we renew our minds and bring our bodies under subjection. But we are saved in our spirit. But then you can have believers. I say you can have believers that are carnal-minded, not spending time in the Word and in prayer. And what happens is their mind stays more so in worldliness and even in much ungodliness. And they're wondering why things don't work out for them. They can be, you've heard pastors say, a lot of times when we get into certain things we shouldn't be getting into and, and things are happening in our lives or things that should happen in our lives, uh, we have violated a spiritual law, the law of the kingdom. And we're spending time and we're natural-minded. Our minds aren't being changed. I submit to you, think about Romans 12. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Go there with me. I'm going away I didn't go. I'm going away that I learned this from you, Pastor. I've gone somewhere, but I'm following the Holy Spirit's lead. And he reads, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. The scripture says that we are not to be conformed. Pastor has taught us that second verse explains how to do the first. We're not to conform to this world, but how much worldliness is in the church? Churches are changing all around especially in the mega, the mega realm. People aren't getting the word of God as they ought. Lives aren't being changed. God is not able to do that which he purposed in the earth. Hallelujah. As we said earlier, God has a purpose for each and every born-again person in this place. And he has a course for you to run on. When we don't study and meditate that word, then we do not become what the Bible calls meat for the master's use. Hallelujah, glory be to God. Caught up in a lot of worldliness. We spend more time on our phones and other of our entities and on the in internet and on television and everything else. That's okay. There's some good things on it. I'm not against the invention. I'm against what you're listening to and what you're watching. Because you're trying to, on one, on one end, you're trying to take in godliness. On the other end, you're taking in a lot of worldliness. Something is going to void something else out. And yet we wonder why our lives do not change. God is not working for me. You don't understand me. And I need this to happen and I need that to happen. Can you pray for me? That's not what the problem is. That's not the problem whatsoever. You have a word deficit. Hallelujah, glory be to God. And I'm speaking to somebody because, like I said, I hadn't planned on going here. This not even down in my notes. But God wants you transformed by the renewing of your mind. The mind is in the soulish realm, as we know word and worship. We say that the soul consists of the mind, the will, and the emotions. And there's a little more to it. Our imagination 
is in the soulish realm. Our emotions in the soulish realm, our wills in the soulish realm, I believe our personalities is hooked up with the soulish realm. Now watch this. What we call the intellect, the soulish realm. Notice what Paul doesn't say. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your wills a living sacrifice. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the word of God, that you present your emotions. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by, brethren, by the word of God, that you present your feelings. I beseech you, beseech you by the word of God that you present your imagination. But all those entities are part of the soulish realm. But he says, I beseech ye, brethren, by the word of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed not by your emotions, not by your feelings, but by the renewing of your mind. I heard pastor teach, the mind is the doorway of the soul. As the mind changes, you notice your emotions can change. Your feelings will change. As the mind changes, you notice that your intellect, your imagination, everything else changes. You may even have a change in your dreams as your mind changes. The mind is the doorway for the soul. Everything else changes. So Paul says, by the renewing of your mind. And that's where the transformation comes in. That's why people change. That's why I prayed when I got up here and I prayed, I said that light of revelation will be transferred to our soul renewing our mind and helping us, actually helping us to become somebody else. Helping us to become that person that God wants us to be. Can you say amen? amen. Jesus had a selfless mind. Jesus also had a sacrificial mind. Um, in Genesis 3.15, we see the first mention of the Messiah, and it stated, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The first telling of the Messiah. John saw the Messiah come and said, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith unto him, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus was that sacrificial lamb. 1 Corinthians 15 and 3 states, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Acts 3.18 states, But those things which God did before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should come and suffer and hath, and hath so fulfilled. Glory be to God. He was the sacrifice of God in behalf of you and in behalf of me. Jesus had a mind of servitude. Go with me to Matthew 20. And 28. Matthew 20 and 28. Let me see here. And it reads Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. That word minister here is speaking of service, to serve. Hallelujah, glory be to God. 
the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance says, to wait on like a waiter or a waitress, to attend to. W.E. Vine says, it signifies to be a servant or an attendant. Can you say amen? Jesus came to serve. Look at Luke 22, 27. And it reads, for whether is greater, he that sitteth at me or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at me, but I am among you as he that serveth. Jesus expects us to serve. Hallelujah. Jesus has, all, has made all of us to serve. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want also you to look at Psalms 37 and 23. Pastor brought out a point, I think it was on last time, last Sunday. And I thought about this scriptures, these scriptures. I'm getting ready to uh, 37 and um, what I say, 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Hallelujah. Jesus was fully given over to his father. He did only what he saw the father do. He said only what he heard from his father. This scripture says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted in his way. Proverbs 20 and 24. Proverbs 20 and 24 reads, man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man understand his own way? God has a way. Only God knows the way that we are to go. We're to follow him. And then, of course, Jeremiah 10 and 23. And it reads, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. It's not even in us. It's not even for us. We were not designed that way to order our steps. We were not designed apart from God. When Adam sinned, he separated. He separated himself from God. Now, he, now God still talked to him because we can see God was talking to him. God was talking to Cain at the end. But he didn't have that, 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 that joining relationship that he had with God. There was a separation. There was a separation in his spirit from God. And now that there's that separation, now God makes a way for Jesus to come into the earth. That's not when he made the decision because Jesus was slain before the, the foundation of the world. That, that's amazing how God is. He knew all the while. He sees the end from the beginning. It's just like you and I in Jeremiah. When the Lord says, when the Lord speaks about to Jeremiah, he says, before you entered your mother's womb, I knew you. God knows everything and always knew everything. Knew Adam was going to sin. He created him anyhow. He created him anyhow. Now, now our, man, our minds can't fathom that, but he created him anyhow. He warned him. He told him what to do and what not to do. And he made, he made by choice, he made that decision. He made that decision. And by the way, I can't pass this because it's too good. I can't pass this up. This is too good. Men are always talking about that woman, what that woman did. But the Bible says, see, this is when you get good teaching. The uh, sisters, the Bible says her husband with her. And not only that, Paul says, reminds us all, Adam was created first. And also, the uh, uh, man wasn't in the transgression. 
He wasn't tricked. He did it willingly. He wasn't watching over his home, over his wife. He went ahead and partook of the fruit. And that's why all y'all ended up like y'all do. I'm just messing. <laughs> I'm just messing. <laughs> Hallelujah, glory be to God. But we were to walk always by design in the ways of God. Hallelujah, glory be to God. Jesus had a mind and a heart to follow the Father. And we are to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in the same manner. In the same manner. As we prayed, he wants to think through our minds. And he wants to speak through our lips. He wants to live a life through our lifestyle. We are one spirit with God. Hallelujah, glory be to God. God is waiting for people to rise up. Waiting for people to rise up. Of people that will show the world the Lord Jesus Christ. We're the only Christ that many people will see until they get to that white throne judgment. We're the only Christ waiting for us to rise up. We got to look at Jesus. See what he has done. See how he has gone. See what it is that we need to do with our own lives. And we can do just that because we are a great people. And we are a great church. And we have a great pastor and first lady. Can you say amen? amen. Can you stand up and give God praise? Amen. Glory to God in the highest. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise and bless your wonderful name.